As 1998 came to a close in the World Wrestling Federation, the company was beginning to record some of their biggest television and pay-per-view numbers. Wrestling was popular again, fans were tuning in to see guys like Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Mick Foley and The Undertaker do what they do best as the Attitude Era rejuvenated professional wrestling as a whole. This popularity also created opportunities. The WWF were expanding their TV presence and live show schedule to meet this newfound demand, and guys had a chance to come into the company and try to get themselves noticed. It wasn't easy though, not only were fans of the Attitude Era a vocal bunch, but the locker room itself has been described as a shark tank. If you got a chance of a lifetime with the World Wrestling Federation, it was a case of sink or swim. Before you became a success, you best learn how to survive. Competition was fierce, everyone was fighting for their spot, and even if you were established elsewhere, a newcomer would have to prove themselves both in the ring and in the locker room. So when Andrew Martin came into the WWF and was immediately aligned with The Rock and the corporation stable, you best believe that the big six foot Canadian was feeling a ton of pressure. Thankfully, Andrew was able to swim with the Sharks while becoming a well remembered superstar of the Attitude era in the process. That being said, the career of a WWF performer took its toll on Andrew and the superstar known as Test would end up paying the ultimate price for the lifestyle of a professional wrestler. Today's video looks at the career of Andrew Martin, better known as Test. Andrew was born in Ontario, Canada on March 17, 1975. In 1996, former WWE President of Canadian Operations Carl DeMarco introduced Andrew to Bret Hart at the Planet Hollywood restaurant in downtown Toronto, and Bret said he was impressed by Andrew's look and size. Bret wrote in his old blog at bretheart.com, I was working a full WWE schedule back then and was preparing to begin teaching or fine tuning some of the many young wrestlers that were starting to pop up everywhere. Andrew was, as my father would say, a fine specimen, 6'6", six six, lean, hard and handsome with a big boyish smile. I wasn't actually looking for any more prospects but I saw something in him and I told him if he could get over to Calgary I'd personally teach him, free of charge. I instantly liked Andrew. Andrew was able to get himself to Calgary where he trained with Brad inside the legendary Heart Dungeon and along with this, Andrew trained with Leo Burke, an unsung hero of Calgary wrestling who was also responsible for training guys like Mark Henry, Ken Shamrock, Edge and Christian. With this kind of training behind him, Andrew was able to make his professional debut in 1997, working for the International Wrestling Alliance based in Manitoba, Canada. During his days in the IWA, the future test worked as Martin Kane. Andrew signed a developmental deal with the WWF that allowed him to receive further training from Dory Funk Jr. Bruce Pritchard revealed on his Something to Wrestle podcast that the second Vince Russo laid eyes on Test, he immediately saw a young version of Kevin Nash and, according to Pritchard, Vince Russo wanted to put Andrew with Degeneration X. Pritchard said, Russo pitched it and we pitched it to Triple H and the other guys in DX and they looked at him and said, he's no Kevin Nash. I don't think anybody is ever going to accuse Kevin Nash of working like Flair, but nobody was going to accuse Andrew Martin of working like Kevin Nash either. He was just green as grass. Due to Andrew's lack of experience, DX apparently decided that there wouldn't be a spot available within the Degeneration X stable. Russo and Vince McMahon, however, knew the big guy had something. He looked like a million dollars and really, Andrew had the size and build that Vince McMahon looks for in a professional wrestler. With DX out of the question, Andrew would find another way to come into the World Wrestling Federation. In October of 1998, the band Motley Crue came over to the World Wrestling Federation for a few live performances on Sunday Night Heat and Monday Night Raw, and Motley Crue would be used to introduce audiences to Andrew Martin. Andrew was presented as Motley Crue's bodyguard, a bodyguard who also tested Vince Neal's microphone for some reason. Before Motley Crue's first WWF performance on Sunday Night Heat, Andrew Martin tested the microphone and this is how Andrew got his name, Test. 
bodyguard test on stage doing some last minute sound check here there he is during the motley crew performances on both sunday night heat and the following night's raw's war presentation test would take care of a few overzealous fans protecting motley crew as the band played their music to wwf audiences just a quick side note the sunday night heat performance has been cut out of the wwe network for some reason but the raw performance is still there in its entirety fast forward to december 14th and the 23 year old test reappears in the wwf when he interferes in a world wrestling federation title match pitting challenger Triple H against the corporate champion The Rock. Test ensured that The Rock left Raw's war still the World Wrestling Federation champion, leading to Test becoming known as the corporation's insurance policy. A great way to make your debut here, Test was given the chance to make a huge splash during a WWF title match with two of the company's biggest stars, and Andre was also put into one of the WWF's biggest heel factions at the time, if not the biggest. At the end of this episode of Raw, Andrew Martin stood in between the the Rock and Shawn Michaels, I mean that's some big names to get associated with. The very next week, Test had his very first WWF Raw match when he tagged up with The Rock to take on Triple H and X-Pac. The match ended in a no contest when Kane showed up to join the corporation, but it was hard not to be impressed by Test's work here. The comparisons to Kevin Nash were obvious of course, but Test moved a lot quicker than Big Sexy and also, Test was young and hungry. The WWF WF must have saw nothing but a huge upside with Andrew Martin. Test made his first WWF pay-per-view appearance at the 1999 Royal Rumble. Stone Cold Steve Austin eliminated the big man from the Royal Rumble match itself and afterwards, Test made his WrestleMania debut at Mania 15, teaming up with Dilo Brown in a losing effort against Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart. Test continued on as a member of the corporation for a little while, but when the corporate ministry merger from hell happened, Test found himself in the Babyface Union faction alongside Ken Shamrock, Mick Foley in the big show. The union defeated the corporate ministry team of Viscera, the boss man and the acolytes at the Over the Edge 99 pay-per-view and from here, Test would get written into the storyline that many fans remember him for. Andrew Martin would get romantically involved with Stephanie McMahon. What you may not know though is that this storyline was supposed to end very differently and Test was apparently devastated when the original plans fell through. Test and Stephanie McMahon began getting friendly with each other at the beginning of 1999's summer season, much to the dismay of protective brother Shane McMahon. Shane tried to make life difficult for Test in hopes that this relationship would get called off, but Test wasn't about to give up on Stephanie just because her brother said so. This all led to a love her or leave her match at SummerSlam 1999. If Shane won, Test would be forced to split up with Stephanie. If Test won, Shane would have to give his blessing to his sister's newfound relationship. The SummerSlam street fight was actually really good, and even with the Mean Street Posse in Shane's corner, who Test had destroyed in the weeks leading up to SummerSlam, the big man was able to beat Shane, and so Shane would have to leave Test and Stephanie alone. People kind of poke fun at the whole Stephanie and Test angle in hindsight, but if you go back and watch SummerSlam 99, you'll notice the huge ovation the test gets when he wins this match. The story was going down well with WWF fans at the time and if the original plans for this angle would have played out as intended, I firmly believe the test would have moved up the cards judging by the kind of reactions he was getting here in the summer of 99. So let's talk about what was supposed to happen. Now this has been confirmed by both Vince Russo and Bruce Prichard. As we all know, test would get engaged to Stephanie McMahon and a wedding would take place on Raw's War on November 29th, 99 after some slight hiccups. To demonstrate how well this angle was going over, Raw scored an impressive 6.5 television rating for the Raw episode featuring the planned Test and Stephanie wedding. To cut a long story short, Triple H married Stephanie before Tess got a chance to. Hunter had sedated Stephanie and brought her to a Vegas drive through chapel to get wed, and so the Tess and Stephanie ceremony ended a little prematurely. The original plans would have seen 
test stand up Stephanie at the altar, Test wouldn't go through with the marriage and thus Andrew Martin would have been made into one of the WWF's biggest heels. In Triple H's DVD documentary, Hunter talks about Vince McMahon not knowing what to do with the storyline and Hunter throwing out an innocent suggestion that maybe he should be the one who marries Stephanie instead of Test in order to further progress the Vince vs Triple H feud that was playing out on TV. And what's so striking about Hunter saying this is that there isn't a second thought given to Test. This was Andrew's big opportunity to progress on to bigger and better things and Triple H just swooped in and plans were changed. Keep in mind that Stephanie would end up double crossing Vince McMahon on pay per view and join Triple H's side in order to kickstart the McMahon Helmsley era. So where does all this leave Test? All in all, Test came out of the whole storyline looking like a complete loser. Triple H had managed to steal his future wife, Stephanie had made a complete fool out of Martin by going with Triple H at the end of the year, and Test just faded back into the midcard after all was said and done. Again, go back and watch SummerSlam 99, fans were invested in the story, the wedding had weeks and weeks of television build up, if Test had turned heel and left Stephanie at the altar, I really do believe his career would have taken a very different path, but thanks to Triple H and Vince McMahon, it wasn't to be. Now, to be fair, the on-screen relationship between Hunter and Stephanie gave us years upon years of storylines. There have been many wrestlers who have benefited from going up against the McMahon-Hemsley regime through matches and storylines, but you can't help but think of what could have been had the original plans played out on television screens. Test got a very short feud with DX out of the whole debacle, and on the January 17th 2000 episode of Raw, Test was moved into the hardcore division where he won the hardcore title from the big boss man. On Test's reaction to the Stephanie McMahon storyline getting changed, Bruce Pritchard said the following. He was devastated. He was led to believe this was going to be this big push for him where he was going to turn heel and have this big run, but obviously it didn't happen. He was devastated and hurt by it and probably more than anything, a little confused. He would walk around like a hurt puppy dog and I think it took a lot of wind out of his sails, that's for sure. After dropping the hardcore title, Tess turned heel and formed a tag team with Albert, known as TNA and managed by Trish Stratus. TNA defeated Al Snow and Steve Blackman at WrestleMania 2000 and the following month, TNA also defeated the Dudley Boys at Backlash. Many people will remember the six man tag featuring the Hardy Boys and Lita taking on Test, Albert and Trish at Fully Loaded, which was a fun match, but all of this was a far cry from the initial plans that had been laid out for Andrew Martin. By by the end of the year, Test had turned babyface once again when Albert attacked him at the orders of Stephanie McMahon, and yeah, this kind of flip flopping between babyface roles and heel roles never has done a superstar any favours. At the beginning of 2001 though, Test was able to defeat William Regal for the European Championship, leading to a match at the well received WrestleMania 17 show between Test and Eddie Guerrero for the European Championship. Test lost the title here, but the match was still enjoyable. From here, Test would go back to the hardcore division. When the WCW ECW invasion angle kicked off, Test was strangely one of the guys who fared quite well out of the whole storyline, which is quite bizarre in itself considering Test wasn't a WCW or ECW guy, nor was he getting booked in prominent positions in the run up to the invasion. During the invasion, Test once again turned heel when he was accused of being the mole within Team WWF. The APA attacked Test due to his friendship with WCW leader Shane McMahon and in retaliation, Tess joined the Alliance on the August 9th 2001 episode of Smackdown. While part of the Alliance, Tess done quite well for himself, defeating the likes of Chris Jericho and Kane and even winning the WCW Tag Team Championships alongside Booker T by defeating the Brothers of Destruction. Booker and Tess also defeated The Rock and Chris Jericho to become the WWF Tag Team Champions, so yeah the invasion stuff worked out really well for Andrew. 
This, however, made fans scratch their heads. In reality, Test was pretty much a homegrown WWF superstar, and many fans saw Test winning these matches as another example of Vince McMahon not allowing true WCW and ECW stars get an upper hand during the invasion. Still, it gave Test a confidence boost it seems. Test had some fairly good matches during the invasion storyline, and he also came across as more intimidating than what he had done previously in the corporation and in TNA. I think Test's best heel work was definitely during the ECW WCW takeover of 2001. Andrew managed to defeat Edge for the Intercontinental Championship on the November 5th 2001 episode of Raw, but he lost the belt back to the future rated R superstar at the 2001 Survivor Series in a title unification match. Edge brought the Intercontinental and WCW United States Championships together with this victory here. So let's skip ahead then and talk about the next storyline of note that included Andrew, that being the formation of the Un-Americans. Test was moved over to SmackDown during the 2002 draft split and in July of 2002, Test, Christian and Lance Storm created the Un-Americans faction, a group of Canadian heels that kinda harkened back to the 1997 Heart Foundation, but admittedly the Un-Americans maybe weren't as successful. Lance Storm led a similar stable known as Team Canada in WCW, and here in the WWF, Lance and the Un-Americans claimed that the WWE had always discriminated against Canadian wrestlers, using the Montreal Screwjob as one of their prime examples. What made the Un-Americans a little different though was the fact that they weren't necessarily pro-Canadian, but rather they were anti-American. Lance Storm revealed that the group was originally going to be named C4, and something to take note of also is the fact that Chris Chris Jericho jumped over to Raw the exact same time that the Un-Americans moved over to the Red Brand, leading many to believe that Jericho was going to become a full-time member of the stable. That didn't happen, though Chris Jericho was an associate of the Un-Americans. Eventually, though, it would be William Regal who would join the group. I'm going to upload a full video all about the Un-Americans in the future, so I'll keep things brief here, but the storyline led to the Un-Americans feuding with the American Badass Undertaker, culminating in a match at the SummerSlam 2002 show where Taker defeated Test. After infighting caused the Un-Americans to break up, Test moved into his next angle with his storyline image consultant and real life girlfriend Stacey Keebler. Many people remember the Test and Stacey Keebler partnership thanks to Stacey suggesting that Andrew refers to his fans as the testicles, and to be honest, this thing kinda worked. While Test had begun his on-screen relationship with Stacey as a heel, fans began cheering for both Test and Stacey as their relationship unfolded on television shows. Stacey recommended that Test got himself a new look, so Andrew cut his hair and began wearing a new wrestling attire. And yeah, things were going pretty well. That was until the WWF decided to once again turn Test into a bad guy in order to get Scott Steiner over. Scott defeated Test at Bad Blood 2003 to win the managerial services of Stacey Keebler, so once again Test had lost the girl. This led to an absolute mess of a storyline where Test won Stacey back, then Scott Steiner turned heel and joined forces with Test and Stacey Keebler was treated like a sort of slave. Maybe people enjoyed this stuff but it wasn't for me. Steiner and Test were fired in storyline by Mick Foley but rehired by Eric Bischoff. The duo had a few tag title shots but were unsuccessful and yeah, nothing more to say. 2004 would be a rough year for Test though, he began a short feud with Mick Foley and afterwards the big guy was pretty much moved over to Sunday Night Heat and in the summer Test re-aggravated a nag injury that put him out of action for months. Test was then released from his contract in November of 2004. Andrew Martin made a WWE comeback in 2006, going over to the ill-fated ECW brand. From here, Test would align himself with the new breed of ECW superstars in their ongoing feud with the ECW Originals. Test was featured in the Extreme Elimination Chamber at the December to Dismember pay-per-view of 2006, and he also got a few ECW title shots against Bobby Lashley in the months that followed. The problem was, Test was in WWE 
WWE ECW and that brand had such a bad reputation that any chance of progression, especially for a guy who had already been previously released, seemed slim to none. In February of 2007, it was announced the test had been suspended for 30 days following a wellness policy violation and shortly afterwards it was reported the test was once again released from his WWF contract. Tess said the release was mutual while stating that he never did rise up to the big leagues in the WWF because he didn't kiss up to the office like some of his peers. Tess then made a few appearances for TNA later in 2007, wrestling his one and only match for the company at the Hard Justice pay-per-view. Tess, Sting and Abyss defeated Christian, Tomko and AJ Styles in a Doomsday Chamber of Blood match. Test then took himself to the Independence, wrestling his final match in 2009. When asked about his feelings towards professional wrestling, one year before his passing, Test said, It was always something I loved from being a kid, but being in the business and seeing what it's really like, it takes its toll on you. Not just physically, but mentally. When you're on the road 300 days a year, you lose track of who you really are. I turned 32 years old and I've been to 8 funerals this year. I shouldn't be going to funerals at 32 years old. As bad as it may sound, it made me open my eyes and take my food out of the grave. It made me step back and ask, what am I doing? Do I want to be in that club? Hell no, I don't want to join that club. So you either clean up and straighten up, or you lay down beside them. Along with failing the WWF wellness tests, Andrew had been arrested on multiple occasions for driving under the influence. Andrew's TNA career was also cut short due to his substance use, and so this gives us an indication that things weren't going well personally for Andrew. In the quote that I just read out though, it does sound like the man was trying to get things back in order, but unfortunately that didn't happen. On March 13th, 2009, police in Tampa, Florida received a phone call from Andrew's neighbour. The neighbour said he had seen Andrew laid out on the floor motionless through his window. When police arrived at the scene, they confirmed that Andrew had passed away. His death was ruled as an accidental overdose. Andrew's brain was examined by the same physician who examined the brain of Chris Benoit and after the examination, the doctor spoke out, saying that he believes brain damage was caused due to excessive and repeated blows to the head. And this played a massive role in both the deaths of Chris Benoit and Andrew Martin. The doctor who performed these investigations, Dr. Bennett Omalu, would become the first man to discover and publish findings on CTE in American football players and other individuals partaking in contact sports. And film buffs would know the movie Concussion was based around Dr. Omalu's life and work. Will Smith played the lead role of the doctor. Unfortunately, the story we are left with is one of yet another wrestler who died too young. To this date, Test doesn't get mentioned at all on WWE TV, there's been no talk of a Hall of Fame induction, and to put it rather bluntly, Test has been forgotten by World Wrestling Entertainment. I put this down to the findings of Dr. Amalu around post-concussion brain damage. After the Benoit stuff, the WWE won't have any talk of head trauma, nor do they want to inadvertently draw attention to it. It's an incredible shame too, no one would put Andrew Martin and Chris Benoit in the same category, but in in the WWE's quest to make the general audience forget, they're also leaving out many superstars who helped make the WWE what it is today. How strange is it that the men and women who took the most severe damage are the ones who don't get the accolades? Benoit certainly doesn't deserve to be celebrated, but many others do. Bret Hart, the man who initially trained Andrew, and a man who stayed in contact with Tess during his entire professional career, said the following after Andrew's passing. He seemed so strong and focused that I never thought to question him about how he was doing. I failed to see the signs of him losing a battle that I thought he'd already won. He slipped and we lost one of the good ones. Nobody has anything but the nicest things to remember about Andrew Martin. He was a dear friend, one of the very few I had left in a profession where too many die too young. Many thoughts and prayers go out to him and his entire family. Somehow, as hard as we all tried, we lost another good soul forever. <laughs>